Let us continue to worship God in prayer. Father, we have gathered together to glorify your name. And we hold on to your promise that if we abide in your word, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free by the grace of your Holy Spirit. Lead us deeper into your word that we may know the truth, that we may abide in your word. Set us free from every kind of bondage and lead us to a deeper union with you. Father, use me as a channel of your word. May I decrease, may Christ increase. May all the glory be to Christ and him alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing our study of Deuteronomy. Today's text in Deuteronomy 15 is an extended application of a Sabbath commandment. The Sabbath commandment gives us a seven-day rhythm, six days of work, and one day of rest. In today's message, we'll explore how this seven-day cycle is extended to a seven-year cycle, and how the sabbatical principle releases us from all kinds of bondage. Now, the Sabbath commandment gets a bad press because some religious leaders, such as the Pharisees, turned it into an oppressive system of rules and regulations. I believe that the Pharisees started with good intentions. They wanted to bring holiness to everyday life and to ensure that they would not violate even unintentionally, the law of God, they raised the bar, they built a fence around the law, exceeding the minimum requirements of the law. So if they satisfied this tougher man-made requirements, then they could guarantee that they, could, they kept the law. But in the process, two things happened. First, keeping the law became mere external observance that had little to do with the heart, and it degenerated into suffocating legalism. Second, the Sabbath rules and regulations became a heavy burden that most common people could not carry. Even the Lord Jesus was accused of violating the Sabbath rule because he healed the sick on the Sabbath. But the Sabbath commandment is not meant to be a burden. In the Gospels, the Lord Jesus lays out an, an important principle for interpreting the Sabbath law. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not meant to be a burden to humans. Instead, it is meant to release humans from their burdens. It is for our freedom that God instituted the Sabbath. It is for our flourishing that God commanded us to keep the Sabbath. So let's begin with the Sabbath commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Okay. Next slide, please. 
I'll read from verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any kind, any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Next slide, please. Now, verse 15 gives the motivation for keeping the Sabbath. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, this commandment was originally given to former slaves who suffered terribly under forced labor day after day, year after year. They had no day of rest. They groaned in pain. They cried out in anguish. Now that God has delivered them from slavery, God reminds them, you have been freed from the bondage of slavery. The taskmasters have no power over you. You are released from forced labor. You are free. Stop working one day a week. Take a full day of rest. Enjoy your freedom. Live as a free people. The Sabbath is not just a commandment, but a celebration of freedom. We know that work is good, and God commands, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but work can become oppressive because of our sinful tendencies. In the Sabbath commandment, God makes sure that manservant, maidservant, resident aliens take the Sabbath rest because they can be exploited by their masters. God includes even animals because animals can be exploited by humans. Sometimes work can be oppressive because of the system we are in. For example, some of you work as accountants or auditors and you know the quarterly cycle of closing the accounting book. For one or two months every quarter, you and everyone in the team have to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week until the numbers reconcile so that you can file the financial report on time. You have no choice but to work, no matter how many hours it takes, because you are in the system. Sometimes work can be oppressive because of the slave driver within. For some of us, we are driven by the insatiable desire to achieve, to acquire, to accumulate. There is something in us that makes us anxious and restless if we do not achieve more and more or acquire more and more, or accumulate more and more in our bank account or retirement account. But that's a form of bondage driven by the slave driver within. The Sabbath releases us from the slave driver within and from our burdens. The Sabbath is made for you and me. It is for our freedom 
for our flourishing. But there is an even more foundational Sabbath principle. The question that goes to the heart of the Sabbath principle is, who is the Lord? Who is your master? Whom do you trust? Now, it sounds like an obvious question. Of course, we would answer, Jesus Christ is Lord. But in real life situations, you are faced with a choice between God and something else. So, who is the Lord of your time? Who is the Lord of your work? Who is the Lord of your money? Now, when you take the Sabbath rest, you are taking a stance of trust. You are declaring, I don't trust my time, my work, my money. They are not in charge of my life. Someone else is in charge. Jesus is the Lord of my time. He is the Lord of my work. He is the Lord of my ministry. He is the Lord of my Sabbath. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus declares in Matthew 12, 8. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That is the foundational Sabbath principle. Who is the Lord? This Sabbath principle is so fundamental to the well-being of humanity that it is extended from a seven-day cycle to a seven-year cycle, to a sabbatical year. Now, the situation in ancient Israel was vastly different from ours, and these Sabbatical laws cannot be applied directly to our situation. For them, for the ancient Israelites, their main property was the land. And they made living mostly by farming. That is, of course, after they entered the Promised Land. Money as we know it today was not the primary means of economic exchange. Instead of money, we need to think in terms of the land the produce from the land, and the labor of farming. In the sabbatical laws, there are profound spiritual insights. But it's not easy to apply them to our situation today because our society does not operate on a seven-day cycle. They couldn't care less. So it's not obvious at all how we can put it into practice. I've been thinking about this for some time, and I believe that the seven-year cycle is not arbitrary. In today's society, many people are overworked, working 60, 70 hours a week, And I believe that there is a limit to working such long hours. Can we sustain working such long hours for 20, 30, 40 years? Probably not, if we want to be healthy spiritually, emotionally, and physically. You see, God designed and created our body and soul. God knows what is good for us. So there is something significant to the seven-year cycle. Still, it's not obvious how we can put it into practice. But let me suggest two general principles that we can reflect on. First, what we need to be released from. And second, what we need to release for the sake of others. Now, I cannot tell you what you need to be released from and what you need to release for the sake of others. That is between you and God. 
But as we go through some of the sabbatical passages, I hope that the Holy Spirit will guide you in the way of truth. So, so that you can live out the truth in your own life. So let's first look into the sabbatical year of release in Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25. And let me read from verse 2. When you enter the land I am going to give you, look, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. In verse 5, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your manservant and maidservant and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you. So for six years they are to labor in the field, till the land, sow the seed, cultivate grain, vegetable, and fruit. But in the seventh year they are to release the land and let the land rest. Leave it uncultivated, meaning there shall be no organized farming for an entire year. And they are to pick up whatever grows from the soil. Now imagine you are a farmer, and you are about to leave the field alone for a year. So how are you going to eat? How are you going to feed your family and your servants? It's no wonder that ancient Jewish rabbis try to find loopholes around this law. You really need to trust God to provide for the entire year. Interestingly, in modern Israel, there is a small but growing movement among the farmers to put this law into practice. During the sabbatical year, they have to live on reduced consumption, but they are discovering unexpected treasures by keeping the law. One of the farmers testified, having to tighten your belt makes you think about everything you buy before you buy it. It's about remembering what's important in life. You stop the rat race, and suddenly you have time to focus on the spiritual and time to spend with your family. So what do you need to be released from? What do you need to release for the sake of others? The second sabbatical text from, is from Deuteronomy 15, the year of release from debts. Again, the context of ancient Israel was very different from ours. Debts, uh, back in their culture, usually meant a portion of the land or produced from the land or labor pledged to the creditor. So let's go to Deuteronomy 15, verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. 
So at the end of every seven years, the debtor is released from the remaining debts and is given a chance to be released from the cycle of poverty. Now in the following verse, notice the repetition of your. Let's go to Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. Next. Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, please. It's a wooden translation based on ESV. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to your needy, and to your poor in your land. Again, notice the repetition of your brother, your poor brother, your needy, your poor. The poor are not numbers and statistics. They are not defined by impersonal systems. They are your brothers and sisters suffering from poverty. They are terribly lonely, they long for relationships. They need to belong to a community. They are your brothers, your sisters, your needy, your poor. So by canceling their debts, you are to give them a chance to be released from the cycle of poverty. Now, what do you do when the end of at when the end of the seventh year is approaching and the poor come to you asking for a loan. The year of release is near and you might not get uh, most of your loans back. Even in such cases, God commands radical generosity because the poor are your brothers and sisters. So what do you need to be released from? What do you need to release for the sake of your poor, your brothers and sisters? Let's cover one more sabbatical law, the year of release from slavery. In most ancient civilizations, Slavery was prevalent. In the code of Hammurabi, a Babylonian king who lived around 1700 BC, slavery was assumed to be an established institution. The Bible also assumes that slavery was part of the ancient Middle Eastern societies. Even in the time of the Apostle Paul, slavery was part of the Roman Empire. It is estimated that one-third of the population in Rome and one-half of the population in Corinth were slaves. So the Apostle Paul letters assumed that slavery was a fact of life. Now, that does not mean that the Bible condones slavery. Every human being is created by God in his divine image. No human being is meant to be enslaved. Then why would God allow slavery to exist? Why would God allow an oppressive system to go on? Now that's a very difficult question to answer in a short time, but let me just give one insight. We can get some insights into the question by how the Lord Jesus answers a different 
but related question about sin. Regarding why God allows divorce to exist, listen to how the Lord Jesus answers it. In Matthew, 19, in Matthew 19, verse 8, the Lord Jesus replies, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Divorce was never God's intention from the beginning, but God allowed it because the hardness of the human heart. Likewise, slavery was never God's intention from the beginning, but God allowed it for a limited time because of the hardness of the human heart. Now, in an ideal community, everyone would be responsible for doing their part. Everyone would be concerned about the well-being of others. And if economic circumstances forced some families to be poor, then they would be taken care of by the community. But in a real community, people are not always caring toward the poor. Some of the poor would fall outside their social safety net. And to avoid starvation as the last resort, they had no choice but to sell themselves as slaves. And God allowed slavery to exist in a limited way for a limited time because of the hardness of the human heart. However, the kind of slavery allowed in the Bible is very different from chattel slavery that existed in America and other parts of the world. Now listen to this warning from Exodus, chapter 21, verse 16. Anyone who kidnaps another and either sells him or still has him when he is caught, must be put to death. Kidnapping and selling a person is absolutely forbidden with a capital punishment. The next slide, please. Also in Deuteronomy 15, verse 12, we see a form of slavery very different from chattel slavery. If your brother a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold to you. He shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year, you shall let him go free from you. Notice that the slave is called your brother, not someone less than you, but your brother with equal dignity. The slaves would serve for six years, and in the sabbatical year, the seventh year, both the male and female slaves must be released from slavery. But if the slaves love their master so much that they would like to stay, then they are given the option of serving their master for the rest of their lives. But it is not forced. It is their choice. This is very different from chattel slavery. And the manner in which they are sent is striking. Deuteronomy 15, verse 13. And when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give him, give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Supply him liberally. The Hebrew word behind it means make a necklace, meaning you shall adorn his neck with a necklace or you shall garland him. It's an honorable, generous send-off. 
The reason God commands such radical generosity is given in verse 14, at the end of verse 14. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. This is the gospel principle that sums up everything about generosity. We give because God has already blessed us. Our giving is a response to the greatest gift we've received, the gift of God's only begotten Son, Jesus. We release others from debts, their debts, because we have been released from our debts by God's redemption. We forgive others because we have been forgiven by God. We help others to be released from the cycle of poverty because we have been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus. That's the gospel principle that sums up the sabbatical release. So what do you need to be released from? And what do you need to release? For the sake of others. Again, I cannot tell you what you need to be released from and what you need to release for the sake of others. That's between you and God. As for me, I've been thinking about this for some time. And I see this phase of my life as releasing everything that God has given me for the sake of building for God's kingdom and for the sake of the lost and the under-resourced. It seems to make sense to me in the light of the amazing gift that God has already given us in this life and in the light of the weight of glory that awaits all believers in Christ. After all, everything we possess is a gift from God. All of life is a gift from God. All of life is grace. Our life, the one life we live, is created by God, given by God, and returned to God. All of life is a gift. All of life is grace. As I close this message, I would like to invite you to a moment of silent meditation in the silence of our hearts. Let us take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us as we reflect on the questions. What do you need to be released from? And what do you need to release for the sake of God's kingdom and for the sake of others. Lord, by the grace and power of your Spirit, release us from the bondage we are in. Break every chain. Set us free. And enable us to release 
what you have given us for the sake of your kingdom and for the sake of others. In Jesus' name we pray.